Welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio, exploring the frontiers of spirituality, consciousness, the esoteric, and humanity's sacred relationship with a living earth. I'm your host, Nick Mather, and in this episode, I am joined by Kobe Michael, author of The Poison Path Herbal. Kobe explains what the poison path is and the marginalized nature of both baneful herbs and those who have traditionally worked with them. He also discusses connections with hoodoo and root work, different ways of working with the plants, plants as manifestation of the spirit realm, the alchemical nature of some of the plants, and why the poison path isn't a dominant feature in Wicca, despite being a part of traditional witchcraft. Kobe Michael is a practitioner of the poison path of occult herbalism and a cultivator of entheogenic herbs. He contributes to the Pagan Archives at Valdosta University, writes regularly for the House of Twigs, and maintains a blog, Poisoner's Apothecary, on Pathios Pagan. He teaches classes and online workshops on plant magic, baneful herbs, and traditional witchcraft. Kobe, welcome to Rebel Spirit Radio. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, thank you for sharing uh, your time with me today. I'm uh, very much looking forward to uh, this conversation. Uh, first, I wanted to congratulate you on your book, The Poison Bath Herbal. I have to say it was very informative and it also was a very enjoyable read. Uh, I think a book like this uh, could have been rather dry, but yours was not in any way. Uh, I appreciated the lore that you included, the history, the mythology, um, as well as the practical uses of these magical plants. Um, so I think the first question uh, for, uh, for you and one that the audience is probably wondering is, what is the poison path? <laughs> um, so in, in the most simplest of terms, the poison path is working with entheogenic, baneful, um, intoxicating plants, for their spiritual and healing properties. And it can even bleed into, you know, invasive herbs or any kind of plant that's sort of like on the periphery or kind of has this wild, feral, um, poisonous in some cases and, and kind of just ostracized nature. So all of the weeds, all of the unpopular plants, all of the, the ones that are, are spooky and scary to people. Okay. I always think of weeds as um, I learned this in my doctoral program, a weed is just a misplaced plant. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, you know, weed is our connotation. Um, and so yeah. um, I think they all have uh, benefits to them. So you, you mentioned baneful herbs. What's that? So a baneful herb is kind of used in as a synonym for a lot of plants. In the, in the poison path or on the poison path. Um, but I use that term to kind of show that they can still have a baneful or sinister or pernicious nature without being poisonous. So not, not all plants on the poison path are poisonous. Not all plants on the poison path are going to kill you or are deadly. Um, you know, but some of them do have that sort of baneful or baleful or just kind of a darker nature associated with them. And that's based on their, their growing habits, their appearance, their medicinal effects, a number of, of different characteristics that would give it that connotation. Okay. It's often the case, I think, isn't it, that um, any herb and any kind of medicine, and I think it's important from my perspective, and I believe you write about this, that these plants aren't just poisonous, but they're medicinal. And every medicine has a positive and a dark side to it. You know, too much can be poisonous, but just the right amount can heal. Absolutely. I tell people that poison really just means potency. Mm, and it's okay. just a way that we used to describe plants that are very potent. So using them in more minute doses is going to give them more medicinal effects. Losing, using them in larger doses can lead to, you know, coma, death, uncomfortable side effects, um, the psychoactive properties, all of that. Okay. So uh, how did you get introduced to this path? Uh, <laughs> I just kind of stumbled on it, I think. Um, 
you know, I've always been interested in, in plants and witchcraft and, and that's kind of been like a simultaneous just developing area of interest for me. Um, and I've been practicing and studying for around 20 years, but I really didn't dive into like the legitimacy of poisonous plants or ethnobotanical herbs until, you know, maybe seven or eight years ago. And I think that I actually kind of found them more so through a study of hoodoo and other American mm -hmm. folk traditions, because in their materia magica of, of herbs that they work with, you know, they're not restricting it to healing, protection, love, all of these, you know, benign workings, you know, we're, we're looking at the full scope of, of malefic magic, hexing, crossing, all of this. So you get into this idea of contagion and contamination and, and the spiritual toxicity of ingredients and, and using herbs that are poisonous or deadly or, or whatever they may be. And so it was kind of from there that I jumped from that into kind of the more traditional witchcraft realm of it, because so many of them are associated with that when we get into the nightshades. And it, it just kind of became an obsession, you know, just a, an area of study that just started to, to branch out into all these different directions. Okay. Uh, I wanted to ask you, uh, you mentioned hoodoo and I uh, maybe you've just answered this for me, but I was curious what the relationship is uh, between the poison path and hoodoo and root magic. Um, and maybe for the audience, if you could say what hoodoo is, uh, that might be helpful. Yeah, so hoodoo is a type of magical practice. Uh, it's very practical in nature. Uh, it's associated with the South and is typically an African-American practice, uh, but there's all, all sorts of different practitioners in hoodoo, root work, conjure. Uh, it's a really vibrant, um, diverse kind of living tradition. Um, but the way that they work with plants is, is more similar to the way that you would see like a, an indigenous shaman working with plants. And there's like a, a communion with the spirit and kind of awakening the plant medicine and, and really working with it, you know, beyond them just simply being ingredients, but actual kind of spiritual agencies that you're bringing into the ritual. Okay. Um, and there are aspects of this that I um, wanted to talk to you about um, because you had mentioned in the book that the plants have a spirit. Uh, you provide this sort of cosmology, I think. And at one point you refer to uh, a cosmology of creation, sustainment, and destruction. Um, but you also mentioned, and for me, this is where the cosmology really kicks in, is that this is inherently animistic. And from that point of view, all of these plants have a spirit or an intelligence. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. So plants are <clears throat> basically the manifestation of the spirit world, the subtle realm, they are kind of on the, on the border in between, um, you know, physical humans, animals, and then the more subtle, more spiritual. Uh, so they just have a really special relationship with, with it there, just in their kind of in-between nature and the way they communicate is very different. And plants are just, they're, they're very otherworldly. Um, in the way they communicate and uh, it's different working with the plant spirit than working with a, an ancestor spirit or an animal spirit or something like that. And uh, the, the plants are teachers and allies. And um, you also wrote that you have to forge a sort of intimate bond, uh, sometimes one-on-one -on -one, uh, with these plants. Uh, and that you also said that the, the, the spirit does the choosing often. Um, so, uh, my guess is that this poison path is something someone is called to. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. It's not something that is going to appeal to everybody. Um, mm -hmm. some people have very, you know, visceral instinctual <clears throat> reactions when it comes to things like this and, um, it's just not for them. And it's, it's definitely not something that is for, for everyone. 
Okay. Uh, how do you find your relationship with the plants developing in your cultivation of them? Um, just seeing them on a daily basis and sort of that regular tending, you know, just the act of, of watering them and seeing them every morning is a very sort of healing and spiritual practice just in and of itself, you know, but then you're actually, you know, kind of in a devotional capacity or offertory capacity, giving them water, giving them attention and all of that. And you just really develop a familiarity for a plant um, when you see it on a daily basis like that. And it's something that you really can't even put into words, but once you've witnessed a plant kind of through its whole growing cycle, then when you go to read about it and study its folklore or its medicinal properties, all of these things start to connect and start to make sense. And it's almost like the plant has kind of transmitted this nonverbal knowledge to you through the process of growing it and being around it every day that when you, you know, really look into it and really start to work with it in that capacity that it just, you know, speeds up all of these little neural connections. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. And I'm, I'm an advocate for that. I do gardening um, uh, myself and try my best to develop a relationship to the plants that I'm growing. And, um, you know, I'm a firm believer that plants do communicate. And uh, I, I guess I have a sort of animistic worldview myself. And uh, so I, I, I definitely see the value in that. Uh, what are some of the, uh, if you don't mind me asking, what are some of the herbs that you grow? And connected to that as well is, do you uh, utilize any wild versions of them uh, wherever you live? So over the past few years, um, you know, building my business and things like that, I, I started out growing a lot of my own things at home and using that. And then kind of had to start outsourcing uh, with some other practitioners that grow as well. And then I've moved over the past few years. So it's really been all over the place. So it's been interesting kind of reconnecting to the, the plants in different environments and growing them indoors versus outdoors. Um, but a lot of them like um, bittersweet nightshade, black nightshade, datura, um, you know, they grow all over the place, all over um, North America, Europe. Um, you know, you can even work with things like pokeweed, which is native to, I think, I'm not sure if it's out west, but definitely the eastern half of the U.S., uh, which is a baneful, poisonous um, plant of North America, which is interesting. It's a lot of them, we tend to pay attention to the ones that come from, from Europe and Middle East and Egypt and, and that sort of area. But there are um, poisonous plants and specifically nightshades all around us. You know, it's a really, really big genus of plants, and it even comprises things like potatoes, tomatoes, eggplant. Um, coffee, nicotine. Do you find a difference in working with these plants uh, between the ones that you grow yourself and cultivate versus the ones you find in the wild? Um, the ones that I find in the wild seem to maintain a little bit more of that, I guess, feral kind of untamable nature to them. Um, but poisonous plants across the board are, are kind of the, the uncultivated, undomesticated. You know, they have a little bit of that scrappy kind of rebelliousness of, you know, I'm not going to grow this way. I'm going to grow this way and do exactly what I want to do, despite, you know, any, any efforts that you may make. Um, but definitely growing something in person and cultivating it, harvesting it, and, and then turning around and using it in your practice in my opinion, it's just going to feel more powerful. It may, it might not measurably be more powerful to anybody else, but for you and for your personal practice, it's definitely going to have much more of a profound effect on, on the inner workings and the amount of energy that you're generating and all of that, because all of the energy, you know, leading up to you using that plant in this spell work or this ritual is now kind of being released. So it's, it's a buildup. I want to get into the history, but before that, I wanted to ask about uh, how these herbs are being used because it's not just the consumption of them, right? You can use them in a variety of different ways. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, yeah, there's there's so many different ways to use them. <clears throat> um, and and consumption is is usually not the way that you're doing it, um, especially when we're talking about like oral ingestion, you know, with a lot of them, especially plants like nightshade, poison hemlock, wolfsbane, you know, if you ingest something like that orally, you may wind up in the hospital or have some very uncomfortable side effects, unless it's a very, very minute or, you know, almost homeopathic type of a dose, um, but they can be used in anointing oils and flying ointments, which are essentially the same thing. Um, they could be used as flower essences, smoking blends, um, you know, you name it. They can really be worked with in essentially the, the same way that any other plant allies can be worked with. Um, you know, but then we can get into kind of the more psychoactive ones, which have benefits as far as microdosing, um, helping things like depression, anxiety, working through trauma and different issues like that. So it's a really broad, broad scope of, of effects and uses. Okay. Yeah. I would like to actually get into, uh, some of the more, uh, details here. Um, I have used, uh, and this is one that you write about, uh, in the book, uh, mugwort. Um, and I don't think that mugwort is poisonous, uh, but I've taken it as a tea. I've uh, done mugwort tea and mm-hmm. as a, uh, supplement to help dream recall. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So that's a great example. And that's one that a lot of people will start with because it does have entheogenic or consciousness altering effects, you know, specifically in the realm of dream magic and divination and scrying and things like that. Um, It's not technically poisonous, but it is an abortifacient. So if you're trying to have a baby and you don't know this and you drink mugwort tea and you lose the baby, it's going to be referred to as poisonous. So it's all kind of like, who's using it, how they're using it, you know, how is that being looked at? So, so poison often means a lot of different things. Yeah, sure. For sure. Do you have a uh, favorite plant that, or herb that you like to work with, or is there a variety of them? I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, definitely a variety just in, in making all of the different formulas that I do. Um, but for me personally, the two baneful herbs that I guess I work with the most on a physical level, uh, as far as like application, ingestion, the more entheogenic side would be belladonna and henbane. Those are my two main yeah. ones. And, and those are very classical uh, uh, herbs for uh, traditional witchcraft, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. So they are the the medieval witching herbs or hexing herbs. They have a really, really extensive history um, association with witchcraft, um, and it's kind of more so the the stereotypical kind of witchcraft that we think of. You know, causing bad weather and, and you know flying around at night and talking to the right. dead and all of these things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, belladonna always just reminds me of Stevie Nicks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about this, uh, traditional witchcraft. I asked you a little bit before we hit recording or before we hit record, uh, about the terminology and, uh, this idea of witch. I think that it, it's a concept that has definitely changed, you know, especially over the past, you know, 60, 70 years with the development of Wicca, Um, But I also know that not every witch identifies as a Wiccan. Um, And there is this history of traditional witchcraft. Uh, And so I was wondering if you could maybe uh, discuss that a little bit. Sure. Um, So where do we start with that? Um, I am not Wiccan. Um, I identify more as a a traditional witch or more of a, a folkloric based witch, I suppose. Um, I totally understand and appreciate the use of the term witch and witchcraft by Wiccan practitioners and other practitioners because by definition, a lot of what we do from the outside would be termed witchcraft. Um, A lot of, you know, it would have gotten us hung or burned at the stake. So if it would have gotten you killed back then, you can call it witchcraft today. But looking back throughout history, when we get into kind of pre-Christian times where 
magic was still being practiced by the wider society. There was still this little corner of people that were doing something that was not completely socially acceptable, or it was against kind of the state sanctioned religion, or, you know, they were doing it solitarily or out in the wilderness by themselves, um, you know, so not in, in congregation with the community or, or with the approved gods or whatever. So there's always kind of been this vein of, of people you know, not, you know, not connected through any type of culture or society that have kind of existed on that periphery, um, you know, and, and magical practice being one of the main things that they're known for, but also, and specifically communication with spirits, communication with spirits of the dead and the underworld, and doing that through the use of oftentimes psychoactive and poisonous plants. So to me, that is witchcraft. It's what's on, on the periphery of what is socially acceptable. It always has that rebellious nature, which by some could be considered dark, um, but by the ones doing it, not so much. Yeah, for sure. Well, we, we need the dark. I, I am constantly railing anymore about people who want to completely banish the dark and just focus on, you know, the light workers, the light workers. It's like, nah, yeah. if we do that, that's kind of problematic. Um, it, it sounds like what you are describing is, aren't these the people that are sometimes referred to as the cunning folk? Yep, cunning folk. I mean, a number of different names. You know, if we're speaking more specifically of like British traditional witchcraft or witchcraft in that area, yeah, cunning men and, and women, I think would be the, the term. Okay. It also seems like there's a uh, shamanic aspect to it. Yeah, I think when we really get to the, the oldest roots of witchcraft, there's definitely a, a shamanic aspect to it. You know, speaking with spirits and entering entering into relationships or situations with spirits on their own terms. So actually traveling to the underworld to speak to Hades, Persephone, whoever, instead of summoning to the, them to this sterile, safe ritual circle. Mm. Mm. You know, to me, that's... <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually a really good point. Um, I, I like that quite a bit. In regards to uh, what you just said, is this how... Uh, the flying ointments that you had mentioned, was that their uh, function? Was that their purpose? Yeah, essentially, um, you know, the flying ointment is a very convoluted kind of a thing too. And it's really tied up in superstition and Christian propaganda and things like that, as far as our, our modern understanding of it and the witch's Sabbath. But, you know, prior to that, these were, would have been commonly used medicinal, medicinal preparations that would have had known psychoactive effects. So people would have been using them for kind of their own private psychedelic spirituality. Do you prefer the term entheogenic versus psychedelic? So to me, psychedelic implies more, more visual hallucinations, something more like magic mushrooms, LSD, uh, and also has connotations with the earlier 60s and 70s drug culture. So the term entheogen was developed to kind of, you know, distinguish from that and, and turn it into a more spiritual direction. Um, you know, I prefer the term entheogen simply because it's kind of always being used in some kind of a, a spiritual capacity um, when we're talking about them in this way. Uh, but they do have like a number of other different effects, such as being delirious or being stimulant or sedative that wouldn't necessarily fall under the category of psychedelic. So entheogen yeah. kind of catches it all. Right, right. Uh, yeah. And I, I liked that distinction because I don't know that entheogenic necessarily means psychedelic. Um, I think it can be a broader term um, mm -hmm. because at one point you did write that achieving hallucinogenic doses is not the goal um, because I think in part the hallucinogenic doses, there's a very fine line between the hallucinogenic dose often and the lethal dose. Yeah. Especially when it comes to nightshades. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, so in some cases, you know, like with, with ayahuasca ceremonies and, and depending on what it is you're trying to do or what it is you're dealing with, you know, sometimes those more intense, cathartic, psychedelic experiences 
are necessary, um, but it's not always going to be necessary in every case. You know, you're not going to down a glass of ayahuasca before you do a tarot reading for somebody, um, but maybe drink some mugwort tea. Yeah, yeah, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Um, I was curious uh, about a couple things here. One, uh, going back to this idea of the plant spirits, uh, you identify uh, at least three of them. I think these are the big three. Uh, Saturn, Venus, and Mercurius. And I was wondering if these also have a connection to the practice of alchemy, um, because I uh, was kind of connecting them to the alchemical elements of mercury, uh, salt, and sulfur. Yeah, there is kind of that connection there to mercury, salt, and sulfur. There's also the connection to the, the alchemical stages of Negredo, um, Albedo, and Rubedo. So black, white, and red, which would correspond to the Saturn, Venus, Mercury. Uh, what would those stages, uh, for the audience, what would those stages be? So Negredo is going to be putrefaction, so where everything is being broken down, um, kind of rotting away. So this would be like the equivalent to the sort of shamanic death um, that one goes through where the, the ego is all kind of pulled apart. And the Rubedo would be, or Albedo would be the Venusian stage, <clears throat> which is kind of the, and correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the recombination of those parts. So once they've been separated, gone through the putrefication process, they're recombined. And then that kind of leads to the next more kind of sublime level of that, which is the, the rubedo stage. So it's kind of an analogy for like our own spiritual and personal development in going through these different alchemical stages. Okay. Is there also, uh, since uh, we've got the alchemical and uh, you've got Saturn, uh, Mercury and Venus, is there also a astrological aspect to the poison path? Yeah. Yeah. So that's going to be, you know, with all plants, they have their, their planetary and their, their astrological influences, um, when, you know, plays a big role just in, in choosing them as, as magical correspondences. Um, the main kind of reason that I went with that three-part categorization is kind of to use those planetary energies and, and tie in the alchemy and, and tie in all of this other imagery because those seem to be kind of the three main archetypes of traditional witchcraft. We have the Saturnian witch father, you know, that original kind of chthonic spirit. Then we've got the, the witch mother, the witch queen, which is on the more Venusian side. And then we kind of come in between and have sort of their divine child, which would be more like, looking at, at the witch father as sort of the, the wild god of nature or adversary of nature or a more mercurial kind of an archetype. So I started to notice, you know, that was sort of the recurring pattern in, in the traditional witchcraft mythology was these three planetary energies. Um, and that was what was, that was really popping up in plants that were most associated with the practice of witchcraft. Um, you know, so beyond more folk magic things like love magic, money magic, protection magic, but things that were of a very occult nature, um, the plants that were most associated with that really seem to fit those categories and almost kind of tell this story of, you know, traditional witchcraft practice or the idea of it, or it's, it's common mythology kind of if that makes sense. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. It, well, it, it, gets me to the question of um, sources um, uh, because, you know, there is this occult knowledge uh, and, you know, occult philosophy of sorts that uh, I think you, you mentioned Agrippa uh, several times in the book. And I would imagine that uh, Agrippa, uh, his three books of occult philosophy is one of the uh, primary sources uh, for knowledge about um, uh, this uh, poison path. I seem to recall reading somewhere in regards to hoodoo um, that Agrippa was one of the primary sources. And uh, I was curious if 
my assessment is correct, uh, how important is Agrippa and what other sources are there? <laughs> yeah, so Agrippa, not, not terribly super important. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a few recipes and a few mention of, of poisonous plants. Um, you don't see a lot of mention of things like henbane, mandrake, belladonna in modern witchcraft or modern witchcraft formularies or anything like that. So the, the most recent you really have is is that time period, you know, around the Middle Ages, and the the information is so scattered, like it was never all saved in one place. You know, it's it's just all over the place, and so you know, kind of doing this detective work of investigating these plants and finding little obscure mentions of them and things pop up. Um, you know, now with hoodoo, we have a lot of the, the Native American um, herbal knowledge, uh, you know, and, and as well as, as herbal knowledge from indigenous people of, of Mexico and America, the Caribbean and all of that. And that's re really where a lot of this knowledge has been saved, you know, as far as Europe goes as far as, um, you know, European witchcraft practices, we've really kind of lost a lot of our ethnobotanical lore when it comes to psychoactive plants, just because in the West, we're so afraid of them and so quick to kind of demonize them. And it's just not been really written about in the past 200 years because nobody wants, wanted to write about it. Um, but to answer your question, um, a few really good resources is anything by Chris, Christian Roch. Um, he wrote the Encyclopedia of Psychoactive Plants, which is going to have the entire, you know, global pharmacopoeia of all of these different herbs. And it gets very in-depth into the chemistry and the effects and, um, you know, naming the individual constituents and things like that. And another one that he did uh, with Claudia Mueller Ebling and Wolf Dieter Storl is titled Witchcraft Medicine. Um, again, that's by Christian Roch. And, and that does a really comprehensive and good job of really looking at the, the mythology, the folklore, the history, the shamanic uses, you know, and how that's kind of trickled down through um, our more modern understanding of magical practices. Um, so that's a really awesome one. And then I always recommend Harold Roth um, and his book, The Witching Herbs, is another really good resource for um, baneful herbs, poisonous plants, entheogenic herbs, um, you know, not all of them deadly poison. So he gives kind of a good mix. Right. Yeah, and, I would uh, I would imagine it would be very difficult to piece a lot of this together, especially from that European aspect, because, you know, as you mentioned, you know, we were hanging and burning <laughs> the people who were practicing this. So we lost yeah. a lot of knowledge during those times. Uh, quite a bit of knowledge was lost. One of the things that I did in preparation for this, I was curious uh, about the role of these herbs in Wicca, because again, you know, Wicca is often, I think in the popular imagination associated with uh, witchcraft. Mm -hmm. And so I, I looked in some sources. Uh, I looked at uh, Buckland's Complete Guide to Witchcraft. I know that's, you know, pretty popular. Uh, I looked at a couple of books by Scott Cunningham, uh, The Shamanistic Witch by Gail Woods, uh, The Witch's Bible, and none of them really discussed any of these plants. Mm -mm. And there was a very brief mention in the witch's Bible on henbane. Uh, but even then it was discussing it being in a bottle <laughs> and not uh, as something someone would consume. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of curious if you have any thoughts on to why these plants, even though there is this traditional usage of them and what we're calling witchcraft, why is Wicca avoiding them or seems to be avoiding them? Gerald Gardner. <laughs> Who was Gerald Gardner for our listeners? 
So, and I can't remember which book it was in, but I was just, I just read through it not too long ago again, but Gerald Gardner actually had said something, I, I think it was in one of his books or articles or kind of a public thing where he'd, he'd sort of demonized like the use of any type of psychoactive in Wiccan religion. Mm. Um, and I don't know if that was just because of the time period and wanting to make it, you know, more socially acceptable to actually be accepted as a religion. Um, with what was going on with the 60s and 70s and the drug culture, counterculture, you know, wanting to, to distinguish from that and not have anything to do with that. I, I think that it was happening and it was probably happening in secret. Mm. And it's just what's been presented more so to the mainstream. It was kept out of that. And I think maybe when you get into more of these initiatory traditions, which I haven't because I've always been solitary, I think that there is still some ethnobotanical or psychoactive kind of plant knowledge that is being used or has been used. Um, but I think, I think that that was pretty much the reason was um, that he just didn't want to, to be connected to that. Okay. And Gardner was the person who developed Wicca, right? Mm-hmm. There's, yep, credited with the development of wicca right british right. traditional wicca right. yeah they they did have listing of herbs um uh you know a lot of herbal use mm-hmm. uh, but the traditional i guess what would be considered the traditional witch herbs you know like henbane and belladonna um those were just gone those were just absent uh, yeah. so i was really curious as to why um you know, why water it down? (laughs) Yeah. Well, and in Gardner's defense too, I think at that time period, anything that you would be able to find in regards to those plants was associated with or coming out of the the inquisition and the witch trials and kind of taken with a grain of salt. And it wasn't until a little bit later and kind of investigating this more that it wasn't just, you know, made up stuff to make things sound scary and diabolical, but they actually had psychoactive properties. Right, right. Um, what advice do you have for someone who wants to explore this path more other than purchasing your book? Um, <laughs> you know, what do you tell someone who feels called to this poison path? Um, you know, knowledge is power and knowledge over fear. Um, if you're really, really interested in it and really want to delve into you as far as, you know, formulating, making things and, and stuff like that, start taking some classes in medicinal herbalism, you know, because that's where you're really going to learn a lot of the, the chemical stuff and the processes kind of necessary to work with these plants on a very physical level um, and to do it safely. Right. I would imagine that identifying these in the wild would be really important. And the cultivation of them, how easy is it to access seeds or cuttings? Um, How would one go about to start growing these? Uh, It's become increasingly more accessible, you know. 10, 15 years ago, there really weren't that many places. And um, Harold Roth, who runs Alchemy Works, who I mentioned uh, with his book, he's been one of the kind of the main suppliers of, of these seeds in, in the magical world, you know, for the past, you know, 10 plus years and things. But now you've got strictly medicinals, you've got companion plants, um, you know, more and more practitioners growing too. So you've got like, seed swap threads and um, plant trading threads on all of the discussion groups and things like that. Um, so I, I sell them when I have extra ones. Um, actually, I do sell the seeds, but, you know, more specifically like little baby plants and things like that. So they are, are becoming much more accessible and they're really fun to grow. You know, they're just really unique, exotic kind of like not hobby plants, but if you like Venus fly traps or, carry on flowers or just odd, odd plants like that. Poisonous plants are just as cool. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I would imagine. So Uh, do you offer uh, courses on um, uh, growing these or the use of them? I think you do offer some classes, right? I do offer some classes. So 
Growing is not really my wheelhouse. I am more on the formulation and chemistry side of it. Um, I do grow them, <laughs> oh, yeah. but I don't teach classes on growing them. Okay. Um, I teach classes on the formulation, on the history of poison, on flying ointments, on you know everything pertaining to the poison path. And typically I do them live. Um, I do have a couple of recorded classes that are available right now on my website. Okay. Um, and I'll go ahead and get that website from you now for the listeners. And I'll also post a link uh, in the show notes in the video description on YouTube. But uh, what, what is your website? It is thepoisonersapothecary.com. Okay. Poisonersapothecary.com. Thank you for that. Mm-hmm. Um, what is the ultimate goal of working with these plants? I think the ultimate goal is knowledge and progress and growth and that's kind of the reason for working with plants in a spiritual capacity is that it kind of takes both of us to really get there and it's helping the plants as much as it's helping us it's helping our spirit it's helping their spirit and it's really just to get reconnected to the natural world and to heal some of the the damage that living in a modern Western, you know, Christian patriarchal society has done to all of us. Yeah. And that is so (laughs) very much needed. Uh, So very, very, very much needed. Do you think that I, I would imagine that working with these plants opens people up to, uh, couple of different aspects that are kind of needed in terms of uh, saying all plants of, as having a kind of spirit to them, uh, seeing a spirit to the world and uh, developing this needed connection to nature. Yeah. 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 It's all about reconnecting, I think. Yeah. Now uh, you said that you work with the uh, um, uh, creating like the tinctures and whatnot. Um, are, are you, how much of this is through your own experimentation and how much of it is it from some of the books that you identified earlier? Um, really <clears throat> a lot of it is just from experimentation and kind of my own personal intuition. And, and basically what I did and what I tried to do in my book was established kind of a baseline threshold. And I did that by figuring out what the medicinal doses were and what the lethal doses were and staying within that. Mm -hmm. Um, And once I did that and kind of standardized, you know, what not to go over, um, you know, then I was really able to, it was more measurable, um, I guess, as far Mm -hmm. as knowing, you know, what I was working with and things like that. So it's been, it's been a lot of reverse engineering. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I was curious and how much of this is uh, knowledge that you get directly from the plant. Um, how much does the plant spirit help you in this? I, I think it helps a lot more than I can even realize that it does. Um, you know, just working with them, handling them, being around them. <clears throat> I think they're working through me you know, even while I'm working on something else and I'll just epiphany come through of a new formula to make or a new recipe. And um, yeah, I I think they're very heavily involved. (laughs) Okay. And uh, uh, just a couple of final questions Uh, for you. It seems to me that we need to perhaps uh, say a word of caution for people who are thinking of exploring this because these plants can be deadly. They, you know, even if they're not deadly, they can have very serious side effects. So how do you caution people about this? Yeah. So again, it it all just comes down to knowledge and education and approaching them, you know, not from a place of fear, but from a place of respect and understanding, um, you know, it's, it's also in some cases kind of blown a little bit out of proportion, you know, almost treating them like they're this, this radioactive thing that is just going to, you know, reach out and poison us. And that's definitely not the case. Um, you know, definitely being cautious when it comes to actually ingesting anything, swallowing anything, you know, it's a totally different ball game when it's running through your 
digestive system and being absorbed that way versus something applied topically or, you know, that. Right. Uh, and you do provide uh, a few, uh, I guess, recipes <laughs> uh, in the book. What is your favorite um, uh, kind of generalized herb that if someone was really interested, uh, you know, I had mentioned mugwort before, is there anything else that uh, you might recommend for someone to explore uh, to step onto this path? Yeah, um, <clears throat> blue lotus is one that's very popular. That's, you know, it's not poisonous, but it is psychoactive. Um, it's going to be more hypnotic, relaxing, euphoric. Uh, it's been used since ancient Egyptian times for its ceremonial and religious purposes, um, often combined with other things like mandrake and, and that. Um, as far as poisonous plants go, henbane is a really <clears throat> um, safe and easy one to work with. Uh, it's not quite as touchy as, you know, belladonna or datura. Um, so that's a really good one to start with. And, and also, you know, using them as incense, kind of remi remembering that, you know, a lot of the, the entheogenic formulas from the ancient world were often, you know, burned as these incense fumigations and things like that. So henbane seeds, henbane herb as a, a ritual fumigation is really good for divination and all types of visionary working. Um, you know, you're going to get a little bit more of a dramatic effect from that as opposed to applying a flying ointment, um, but it's not going to be, you know, as intense as, you know, drinking a tea of it or something like that. So that's a good place to start. Okay. With the um, incense, would there still be the same kind of dangers um, uh, some of these uh, plants have? I, I would think that it would be a little bit less than ingesting it. Yeah, because you're you're inhaling it through the the ambient kind of environment. You know, it's not all being inhaled directly. Um, you know, if you were to burn a, a handful of it in an enclosed room, you know, you're going to have that delirium. You're going to get a headache. You're not going to feel very well. Uh, it's not going to kill you, but you'd have to burn a really really obscene amount of it to really have any negative negative side effects. Um, you know, typically burning incense, you know, a little pinch at a time. We're well within like a, a three gram threshold there. Okay. Well, it makes me want to try to grow some henbane so I can use it the next, you know, my tarot readings. Um, <laughs> all right. So uh, what's next for you? Oh gosh. <laughs> um, so I'm just trying to catch up from everything this fall and winter and, and all of that. Um, but I do have something that I'm planning that I'm really excited about that's going to be happening um, the 19th and 20th of March. So for the Vernal Equinox, um, doing my first virtual conference. Okay. Um, it's called Botanica Obscura. Um, so it's gonna be about poisonous plants, um, exotic plants, carnivorous, carrion, um, you know, any kind of weird, Weird Plants is, is going to be in the, the virtual conference. Uh, so I've brought together a collection of different presenters, um, people like myself and other herbalists, other plant practitioners, um, you know, psychedelic spirituality people. Um, we're gonna be doing a week weekend long of, of different presentations and discussion panel and all of that. So that's coming up. <laughs> Is there a place that people can go to find out more information about that? Um, the Instagram is live. Um, that's Botanica Obscura Conference. Um, you can also find out about it on my website, which I gave you. Um, and I'm working on developing the Botanica Obscura Conference.com website, but I still have a few things to add to it before it goes live. And you've already given the uh, your personal website, so I'm not going to ask you where people can go to get more information because we already have that. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, Kobe, thank you so much for your time this morning. I really appreciate it. Uh, it was a pleasure speaking to you. And um, I really do want to get some of that incense now. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I have the henbane incense. I'll, I'll send you a sample of some. You should um, email me your address. Okay, yeah, <laughs> I'll do that. Yeah, yeah, I have I, I have an interest in um, uh, trying to create some incenses 
uh, on my own. Uh, I have a shop in Denver that I often get them from. Um, and I've found a few other places on Etsy um, for, I actually have some Saturn incense, but I'm not entirely sure what's in it. Uh, mm -hmm. I should uh, look at that. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I would like to start developing my own incenses, I think. Nice. So, yeah. Very cool. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Uh, uh, yeah. So, well, again, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. My pleasure. Enjoyed it. Thank you. Please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you also hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. And that's a wrap on episode 26 of Rebel Spirit Radio. Thank you so much for listening or watching if you are part of my YouTube audience. If you enjoyed this podcast, please make sure to give it a positive rating on whatever platform you use to listen to podcasts. It only takes a second and your five-star rating really does help. If you have a minute to spare, consider posting a short but positive review, and please consider subscribing. For those viewing on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. Make sure you also hit that notification bell so you will be informed when I upload new content. I've been trying to release episodes weekly and would like to continue to do so. I'm also working on creating additional video content for the YouTube channel, including book reviews, educational videos on topics concerning spirituality, the history of religion, and the religious response to the climate crisis. But that extra content takes a lot of time and work. If you would like to support me in creating free and credible material on YouTube and continuing with this podcast, please consider making a one-time donation via PayPal. You can find a link for that in the video description or show notes. Your support makes my work possible. I'm Nick Mather, and you've been listening to Rebel Spirit Radio. Until next time, may you be in peace, may you flourish in all possible ways, and may you continue to nurture your rebel spirit.